Hey guys, welcome to the Lean to the Left podcast. Today we're talking politics, and with me are Arthur Hill from North Carolina and Robert Thompson from Georgia. I'm a Marylander transplanted into South Carolina, so together we're the Dixie Dems. There's a lot to talk about today, from the Republican candidates dropping like flies, leaving Nikki Haley the only Trump challenger remaining, and much more. There was a cross burning in South Carolina, raising the ugly specter of days gone by and sex getting in the way in both Georgia and Florida. So stay with us. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no holds barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people, some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who will show up at Lean to the Left. Now here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Now, Arthur Hill is vice chair of the Brunswick County, North Carolina Democratic Party. And my buddy, Robert Thompson, is based in Atlanta. He founded Peach News Now and its opinion podcast, Got Damn Liberals. That's G-O-T, Damn Liberals. Me, I live in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, and spend my time hosting this podcast and producing the Lean to the Left blog site, which you can find at leantotheleft.net. So welcome, guys, to the Dixie Dems on the Lean to the Left podcast. First, let's talk about Donald Trump's running roughshod over the remaining Republican presidential challengers, with DeSantis and Chris Christie both dropping out, leaving only Nikki Haley as the remaining obstacle to his taking the GOP nomination. Now, he beat Haley in New Hampshire, but not by as much as he had predicted. He had a margin of around 8%, and he was bragging that he'd knock her off by about 30%. Anyway, could be her last shot will be the South Carolina GOP primary. She's planning a $4 million advertising buy in this state, but the most recent poll shows her trailing Trump by about 30 points in South Carolina. Do you guys think she's got a prayer? What do you think? Bob, you're there local in South Carolina. What what are you seeing? Like when you ride down the road, are you still seeing Trump signs and flags everywhere? No, (laughs) I'm not. I'm not seeing a huge demonstration of support, but I'm not seeing a demonstration of support for her either or for anybody. Right now, nobody's really thinking about this primary coming up. I'm sure it'll change when the ads start running and we get closer to uh, to the primary. Now, the Democrats have a primary in earlier. There's only Biden and, and some lesser lights, so that's not going to generate that much. So anyway... I can speak a little bit here for Georgia. I live in a bubble, honestly, here in metro Atlanta. Yeah. The only time that I really ever see the Trump name is pretty much on someone's bumper sticker. Yeah. Or maybe they've got it on the back. But again, I have to admit, you have Metro Atlanta and you have the rest of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Once you get outside of Metro Atlanta, you will see these people that are living in their own bubble. Right. And they've got those Trump signs up and they just feel like they're under attack from what I don't know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And we'll get into some of this in a little bit, but those people, you can't change their minds. I, I think we all, it's its going to be up to, and, and we watched some of the results from New Hampshire the other night, and it's going to be up to the independents. Um, I remember someone who was up in New Hampshire was talking to someone up there who voted for Nikki Haley, and they said that if Trump was the nominee, they were just going to stay home. Yeah, I saw and, some of that in the Washington Post this morning. There's some quotes from some people saying that if they were for Haley and if Trump was a nominee, actually they were going to vote for Biden. There were a couple of quotes like that in that story from the Post. Yeah, so, but I, I don't think we can count on that too much. There's, there's, oh, I don't think so either. There's, there's probably a small percentage of folks who will do that, and there's probably a equally small percentage of folks who are Republicans who will stay home on election day, but, but you can't count on that. Can't count on that to win. But having said that, I think it's still noteworthy that enough people who call themselves independent voted in the primary yesterday 
largely apparently for Nikki and, and against Trump. Uh, mm-hmm. That's what I'm seeing so far. And I think that bodes well for Biden, at least in New Hampshire, in the fall. And one can hope, only hope that uh, the same sentiment will uh, be uh, true in a majority of the states in the country. Because if it's not, then I think if uh, we haven't been afraid of uh, the consequences of uh, Election Day 2024 now, we need to be afraid. We need to start being afraid right now. I think in the longer term, the prospect of Trump actually pulling this off is real. And it it pretends uh, nothing but evil for us unless we go out and campaign our butts off for the rest of this year and, and prevail in November. It's getting scary out there. Yeah. The, the other thing I want to point to, and it, we've seen it in the past here in Georgia with our governor, our gubernatorial election, is some folks going into the ballot booth and they get further down beyond the presidential election, beyond the governor's election. And they start getting either just ADD or they just are beyond the name recognition and they just stop voting. Or you have another type of voter that goes in the voter booth and they're diehard, maybe Trump Republican, and they just mark everybody that's Republican all the way down the ballot. You you have a lot of different, I'll call them strategies, and different kinds of voters that uh, let's go back to that, this rabbit hole that we just started going down. If you have someone that's just going to stay home, that they're not going to vote Republican. If they're, as I say, a Bush Republican and they can't stand Trump, then that's a lot of Republican votes that have been lost there. If you have someone that is a diehard Trumpster, they're probably mad as hell. (laughs) They go into the voting booth. They're going to vote Trump and, or maybe they just vote for him and just walk away too because they think that all the rest of them are rhinos. You've got so many different strategies, and and you never know what these people are thinking when they go in that voter booth. And I'm not trying to overthink it, but this is it's literally going to come down to, again, a bunch of swing states, as it did the last time in the last several elections, and every vote is going to end up counting. And these independent voters and and trying to get into some of these people's heads it's every vote's going to count. Yeah, and I Georgia's agree with that. Play. Yeah. I agree with that 100. But don't you think there's the old saying, many a slip between a cup and a lip. And the many a slip that might be coming up are all these court cases against Trump. Now, if this guy is gets convicted of criminal on, on criminal charges, I don't care that that he is trying to frame that as being treated like shit for political reasons. I don't care. The fact of the matter is he's going to be a convicted criminal. And I just don't believe that this country will elect a convicted criminal to be their freaking president. Yeah. Let's, let's look at history. First time he did not get elected on the popular vote. He got elected by the Electoral College. The second time he lost when all that other crap came out. And this time around, there's even more crap that has come out. It doesn't look good for him. It is It is true that he has an incredible uh, mountain to climb uh, yeah. in terms of, of winning in November. But just the thought of uh, the Proud Boys goose-stepping down Pennsylvania Avenue just scares the crap out of me. And uh, and I hope it scares enough people that, that even if there is no cr- criminal conviction in any of these cases that are coming up, it's just... An, it's just a terrible thing to to imagine, and and it just it's bothersome. It's scary, and it needs to be addressed. I, I can't stand Karen Nikki Haley, but kudos to her for being the Bush Republican here yeah. and being the the mom <laughs> in the party. If you heard her the other day, she said, I, "I'm the one." I'm not quoting her exactly, but she was saying, "I'm the same one here. I, I'm not the one that's going to have to go up there." And with all these felony trials, possibly convictions and all these other things, I'm literally the same one here. And also she pointed out that Trump was on the ballot several other times and he lost horribly. Republicans lost the House and he he had all these candidates that he went out for and it didn't work. So not only has he lost, but he also lost other races and other things for the Republicans. 
Yeah. But as we said, you, you cannot vote for all that because the, the polling looks horrible right now. Yeah. Whatever yeah, that I, means. I think she makes a lot of sense when she talks about ending the chaos and where she doesn't make as much sense to me, for me is she talks about, talk, she refers to the chaos as far as Trump's concerned. And she keeps referring to Biden's inability to uh, think past the 2020 election as well. And I don't get that argument at all. I don't understand that. Biden's done everything he can to, to propel himself past the 2020 election. And, and he's got a lot of accomplishments that he's made in doing that. I don't completely buy her argument on why she's a viable alternative. I, I halfway buy it with Trump, but I, I don't see if for some reason Trump fails to become the nominee and she winds up being the nominee. I, I think she has to hone her skills as her debating skills against Biden because the claims she's making just don't stand up. Anyway, I, I, I think this is all about 2028 as far as she's concerned. I, I think she's done a great job of setting herself up for that so far. What would you guys think about the, I don't know if you saw the photos from New Hampshire yesterday. What's his name? Whatever. I never could say his last name. That Ramaswamy or whatever. Ramaswamy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Him and Tim Scott standing behind Trump looking like a couple of servants. Three stooges. Yeah. Yeah. Crack me up. Then there was then there was the exchange between Scott and uh, Trump on the podium at, during the victory speech. What was that? I didn't see that. I turned to Scott and said, "Man, Haley must really hate you." Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw and, that. Uh, and and he said, "Don't you hate her?" <laughs> and he said, "I love you." Yeah, you geez, <laughs> old flip. And speaking of Senator Tim Scott. <laughs> he got down on his knees the other day on Keel Island and proposed to his girlfriend. Ah. <laughs> now, Scott said he was thrilled to have a fiancé who shares his devout Christian beliefs. Uh. The cynics among us might suggest that mm, this is part of his campaign to be Trump's VP selection. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to Google it, but I didn't want to feel nauseated. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, for crying out loud. Then we got all this other sex stuff that's going on here. We got the Florida GOP chair who, this cracks me up, he got kicked out of his job because he and his wife admitted to a three-way a three-way sex encounter and, a, and then a he got involved with a rape allegation. And then we've got Fannie Willis in Georgia hiring this outside attorney with whom she's apparently having an affair to help her in her case against Trump. Now, Robert, you got the goods on that one? No, because I'm not Trump's fixer. So oh, you might remember much. that this was Michael Cohen's job. Yeah. When he worked for Trump years ago. And how many times did Trump just call Michael Cohen up and say, how much is this going to cost me? Let's remember Stormy Daniels, etc. Michael Cohen was tired of the bullshit. And now they're apparently, I don't remember the gentleman's name. It came up in the episode. And those of you here in Georgia that have access to it, and it's on YouTube, it's called The Georgia Gang Every Sunday Morning. And it's a really interesting show where they go down some of these rabbit holes. So from what I understand, the whole Trump's current fixer is the one that drummed all this BS up. And it's enough BS to where they got it in front of the right judge. And apparently they're going to go back and pull some stuff out of a divorce decree or whatever. But literally, it's the same old ammo. You've got Trump just trying to find a fixer just to shed any sort of doubt on anything that's going on. Good luck. And again, this backdrop that I keep putting up on, on every one of our episodes, it becomes more and more relevant every time. you got Miss Willis back there for RICO statute, and how many deals has she already made? She wouldn't be making those deals if these folks were not guilty. I don't know. Do you feel like there's a chance she could get thrown out of the cases? Well, she gets okay, dismissed. If she gets thrown out, then somebody yeah. else is going to try. Yeah, that's right. It doesn't yeah. make a difference that the case is still valid. You right. already have plea deals that have already been signed off by a judge in this whole RICO case. I don't. That's, that, but, so I don't understand this at all. If Robert, if you're right, 
if you're correct, and I have no reason to doubt your claim, why would they do it? In the end, all they might have turned a few heads and they might have swayed some public opinion and so on, but justice still marches on here, doesn't it? It doesn't stop the yeah, case. I mean, oh. let's say that she's removed as the Fulton County District Attorney. They're just going to put someone else in there. Yeah. It's not like they're just going to vacate the office for a year. <laughs> No. You know, and everything just comes to a, a screeching halt at the Fulton County DA's office, the busiest DA office in the whole state. <laughs> Conceivably, though, this could delay this case for a long time, right? That it could. That's yeah. true. Yeah. It could delay. Quite possibly, but it still just adds that whole level of doubt. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll just reiterate that there have already been several plea deals in this whole RICO case where people mm-hmm. have just like thrown their hands up. Yep, I'm guilty. What kind of deal can I make? And it has, it has no bearing on the federal case, which includes a lot of the same charges. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So that 91 different charges Trump, I think, is up against. Yeah. Can, can you imagine waking up every morning and have 91 different charges that are weighing on you? It just... That, that's a lot on an old man. <laughs> I, can't, I can't imagine going to sleep at night with 91 charges on my oh, I, I couldn't yeah. either. I couldn't either. I remember one time when I was at a conference and my cell phone, I got a message on my cell phone that the IRS was after me. And, yeah. and I got scared. I was sitting right in the middle of this conference taking notes. I was working for my client and I'm going, what the fuck? And so I got up and went to the bathroom and I called the person and who said that I had to send in $3,000 that day or I was going to get arrested. And I mentioned it to one of my buddies and they said, oh, that's a scam. It's a, it's just been yeah. going on. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, and but it scared the living crap out of me. Now, that was just one thing. That then wasn't even true with the IRS, and I was scared shitless. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trump's got ninety-one charges against him, and I, federal. Yeah. One of, the I, one of the things I've learned in my ever increasing lifespan is that uh, you don't mess with a U.S. attorney. You don't mess with a U.S. attorney. You don't mess with the federal justice department. It's you just don't do that. And Trump's done it ninety-one times. And, yeah. It's just, it's overwhelming. Yeah. Not yeah, that I'm sorry for him, but it's its just, the thought of it is just overwhelming. And the fees he's got to pay, or actually his contributors are paying, the legal fees are, are daunting as well. It, it's just, uh, it's just chaos. Yeah. Speaking, Speaking of that, and I don't know if we're going to get to it, and I can't remember who pointed it out, but someone in Florida has introduced a bill down there to help Trump pay for his legal fees because he lives down there now. So they're going to use they're going to use Florida taxpayer money to to pay his legal fees if it passes. Allegedly, allegedly. Man, <laughs> I can't imagine how that would pass, but it's Florida, so you never know. Another well, reason I'm not surprised to, to yeah. see DeSantis go down the toilet like he couldn't have been happier to a better man. I know <laughs> that, but wow. were you surprised? Were you surprised? No, no. It, it, he, he is the most unlikable person. I've never seen him smile. To listen to him talk, he's just not personable. He just, it's just a nasty man. I no. Yeah. He he needs to go away. Uh, he, no, <laughs> well, it looks like he's going I was, to. I was I was yeah. surprised because I thought so many people liked his nasty demeanor, and they just thought that this guy is just Trump without the baggage. Yeah. But I tell one 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 thing that I saw that somebody wrote, which he, they said DeSantis's tragic mistake was not campaigning with his family. Uh, I don't know anything about his family. I don't. I've, I've never heard his wife or. or if he has adult kids, I never heard any of them speak. But but apparently apparently they're very charming, and and the thought was that if he'd used them more on the campaign trail, that he might have been able to overcome his stony demeanor that wound up killing him. Yeah, they I, probably don't like him either. <laughs> I think it was yeah. I think it was all. I think it was all person. It was all personality. People weren't arguing against his politics. These people who supported him weren't. They were just turned off by his personality. Plus, he had this weird campaign structure. He had a super PAC basically running his campaign. I don't even know how that's legal. 
But they were calling the shots on the ad buys and, and a lot of other stuff. And DeSantis was clearly out of money on his end. So he had to count on this super PAC. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand. Somebody needs to investigate that to see whether any laws were broken because the super PACs are supposed to be totally independent of the campaign yeah, committee. There should not be any collusion there. <laughs> no. Exactly. No collusion. <laughs> The other thing I wanted to ask you guys was, there's a story in the Washington Post today, a column by Data Milbank. Yeah. And it talks about Trump's misstatements and indications of dementia. And it's a pretty good piece. And it cracks me up that people are trying to say that Biden is the one that is too old and is he can't handle the pressure. I think the guy has demonstrated he can indeed handle the pressure. I can't imagine how somebody, he's my age, and I, I can't imagine doing everything that this guy is doing under the pressure that he's got and doing it as well as he's doing it. Just incredible to me. And he needs to get credit for that, in my opinion. I, I think he will. Well, I think he'll also get credit for the fact that he takes care of himself, that he's in good health. Yeah. Uh, and whereas Trump has a big, huge steak for dinner every night. And yep. uh, uh, he doesn't drink, but uh, but still, he doesn't eat right. And uh, and he's older than, and he's older than, uh, no, I guess he's not older than Biden. Uh, no, he's younger by he's about four years. There. It's comparable. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I think people are starting to take a look at, you you talked about Dana Milbank and his piece, but uh, I think people are starting to take a look at uh, Trump's uh, physical fitness, not just his mental fitness or mental acuity, uh, uh, yeah. his politics. But uh, matter of fact, I have a photo that I'm going to put it up with this video of it's a combo photo showing Biden on his bike riding his bike, mm -hmm. and Trump with his big belly hanging out sitting in a golf cart. Yeah. And it's just quite a contrast. Nikki Haley pointed this out, too. Nikki Haley has been attacking Trump. Yeah. And I, th I think the best that Trump could respond with is he got her mixed up with Nancy Pelosi the other day. Yeah, yeah that was funny as hell. I was <laughs> Nikki Haley refusing to um, call in the National Guard on January 6th. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but if, if you put this old senile man in front of a microphone and a camera and just let him ramble on for 90 or two or three hours. He's yeah. Bound to, yeah. His uh, speech what, what is he going to come up with? His, his speech in New Hampshire was a hundred minutes. Yeah. And Dana Milbeck said that I listened carefully, which was quite a job considering <laughs> that he went on for a hundred minutes. <laughs> and he kept, a repeat, I mean, it's a, he kept it's repeating a himself saying the same stuff over and over again. Oh, okay. man. Anyway. Not exactly the Gettysburg Address. <laughs> yeah, anyway. All um, right. So what else you guys got? I want right. to know where all these people are so unhappy with Biden and our vice president. The stock market hit another all-time high. Unemployment is low. Inflation has slowed down. We're getting 5% interest on our savings account to combat inflation. Mm -hmm. to encourage people to save money. Mm -hmm. Why? Are, so when, when Biden got elected, what were they wanting to happen yeah, beyond what has happened? I know. It, I, that's the question that I wanted, to, and it's crickets. Yeah. All you hear about are these polls out there of these unhappy people and Biden is shit, and I don't know who our vice president is. Okay, then, then give me what do you expect to be happening? Yeah. And it's crickets. I'm sick and tired of this. Yeah, one of the things uh, that please, really... Please, comment here. Yeah. Uh, please, because tell me, because I'm at a loss. Yeah, I, I don't understand literally why... Literally right now, more money than I've ever made in my lifetime. Yeah, I, I'll admit that right now. I'm going to pay more in taxes because I'm making more right now than I've ever made in my lifetime. I, please tell me, where, where, what am I doing wrong? I don't understand. Please tell me. I don't know. Sounds like you're doing something right to me. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. I mean, on you, that you, you, yeah. You two gentlemen are still retired. You're still, I assume, still able to live comfortably retired, right? I, I just, I, where are these people? 
and, yeah. and, and what, what kind of bubble are they living in or what circumstances are they living in? Obamacare is another, I, I am on Obamacare right now. My mother is on Obamacare. My former coworker, he unfortunately got laid off. He is on Obamacare right now. The Republicans gave up with trying to disassemble Obamacare because it's working right now. And again, please tell me, what do people expect beyond what is going on? And that's really a message, especially going into these next couple of months, that we really need to echo. Headline today, Washington Post again. Obamacare enrollment hits record level as Trump vows repeal. Now, what the hell? Why yeah. would... And replace it with what? With what? Death care? It's just, it makes no freaking sense at all. He's never no. had a proposal for no. a replacement. No. There never was one. No. Uh, and then, and I just did a piece today about student loans. There was a piece that came across my desk that, that said that a lot of people with student loans who were expecting to get them forgiven are now refusing to pay since the... The pause has been lifted, and they have to now pay. They're refusing. They're saying they're protesting, and they're trying to force the government into passing the Student Loan Forgiveness Act. The Supreme Court turned that down. And so after the Supreme Court turned it down, now Biden has been working his butt off to find other ways to help these people and came out with another one just yesterday, I think it was, where a certain group of people, mostly nurses and teachers and people like that, can have their student loans forgiven under a certain set of circumstances. He's trying every way he can administratively. And yet I keep reading that group of people, people 45 and younger, and a lot of African Americans are upset with Biden because he hasn't been able to completely wipe out student loans. Come on, man. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we need to just do another civics class back from high school because the, the man can only do so much. What's encouraging is that is that every day that goes by, more people are becoming aware of some of the things that, that he has done. Where I am right now, infrastructure is very much on the front burner. We've got a huge debate going along about a, a bridge that goes from Brunswick County, where I am, into the city of Wilmington, crossing the Cape Fear River, which is about to fall down. It needs mm -hmm. to be replaced. And so the question is, how do we pay for it? And the the Department of Transportation for the state has said, we got to pay a toll. That's how we're going to pay for it. And everybody here is saying, wait a minute, we, got, we just got this infrastructure bill that just got passed. And it has right. billions of dollars specifically for construction of Bridges or the or the or the replenishment of bridges and roads, and so we got that money. Why can't we use it? We can't use it because this. So no, we can use it, and the state government has to change its mind. So that's a huge. As a matter of fact, there's going to be there's going to be a protest uh, this weekend in Wilmington about the a measure that they want to impose tolls. State wants to impose tolls on residents down here who cross the bridge every day. So infrastructure. The more you hear about. Debates like that, the more what Biden has done with infrastructure, making billions of dollars available, if we choose to use them, is going to become a better deal. And I think the uh, the IRA, that act, has uh, just an incredible amount of uh, benefits for everybody that no nobody seems to be aware of yet. And uh, the word needs to get out about that. Uh, climate change. Uh, there needs to be more said about what's going on in climate change. I see John Kerry is now going to, he's, he's going to uh, retire as the uh, ambassador for climate change. But that doesn't mean that the move toward clean energy isn't going to move forward. It's moving forward very rapidly. And there's jobs associated with that. And I think more and more people will, we've got a couple of battery plants that are being built in North Carolina right now. Things are going on. And every day that goes by, I think is going to is going to help make a difference in people's perceptions of what's been going on for the last three and a half years. I hope you're yeah. right. I'm and, just, and just to tag on to that that uh, that climate stuff, Exxon this week is suing their own shareholders. Yeah, what's that about? So there's a group there, and and I'll okay, I'll, I'll go ahead and admit I do own some Exxon stock. It's not sizable compared to what these other people are. But there's a group of investors at Exxon 
that want Exxon to just do some things to help the climate thing. And Exxon is saying, it doesn't make financial sense. We're going to sue you. But these are owners of Exxon. Hmm. And is it is it clean energy, climate change stuff? Is that what these... I would assume. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It's, really? You're going to X, big Exxon making all this money. Exxon has paid a dividend forever. Yep. They're not going to stop making money. Nope. And But yet they're going to go out and pay all these lawyers to sue their own shareholders. Yeah. Well, the other thing, speaking of climate change and all that, of course, electric vehicles is a big part of, of what can be done to uh, reduce greenhouse gases, which contribute to climate change. And what did Trump say yes the other day? He said that electric vehicles couldn't go far and that they were useless and that Biden was wasting his time and wanting to spend billions of dollars on cars that just don't go far. And he made that statement several times in the same speech. Somebody ought to somebody ought to tell him that Louis DeJoy, who was a Trump appointee as a head of the Postal Service has just overseen the largest purchase of electric vehicles in the world. You know what? That's really good news. I did a podcast interview the other day with a woman who is an executive for a company that is called Movie V that advocates for electric vehicles and has come up with some ways where companies can actually pay their employees, reimburse their employees when they charge their company the electric vehicles at home overnight, they can pay the employee with a system that they've set up. And I think that's really good. And she also pointed out that it improves health. Kids are suffering from asthma and respiratory diseases, not just kids, but kids are, by the thousands in urban areas that have a lot of outdoor pollution caused by vehicles. Mm -hmm. And the more that, and there have been demonstrations from Norway and California that show that when the use of electric vehicles is increased, it reduces the amount of hospital visits for people with respiratory illnesses. That's mm -hmm. important. That's really important. Mm -hmm. And and the guy just, he doesn't, he does not understand the facts on that subject. That's just clear. Anyway, and, and bringing two or, two or three of those home here too, just this week. One, I think it was in Northwest Atlanta. There's a large now fleet postal vehicles that are electric. They were just launched, and they they had the the, the press conference over there. What I'm not going to like though about an electric postal vehicle is I'm not going to know when the postman has actually stopped by because it's going to be quiet. <laughs> you, you, won't be able to, yeah, you won't be able to hear him. <laughs> I'll, I'll actually have to go out there a couple of times and know if the postman actually came by. Oh, that would be a shame. I do that all the time anyway. <laughs> but, a, but a former employer, I, I will give you another um, example. Um, uh, it's a large airline based in Atlanta um, at their corporate headquarters uh, pretty much every day. They're, all of the electric vehicle chargers are full, and they have to charge for those chargers. Otherwise, there would be so much demand, they would not be able to keep up. So just a point to ponder there. Yeah. All right. I wanted to talk about a few things going on down here in South Carolina, but before I do, you guys have anything that you'd like to add that we haven't discussed? Just some calls to action we can either do now or later at the end of you guys. Okay, let me run through this stuff that that's, I think is pretty important, and then yeah. we'll get to that. But we had, I mentioned at the top, we had this situation in Conway, which is the county seat for Horry County. And Horry County is the coastal area where Myrtle Beach is. A white couple burned a cross facing their black neighbors in an effort to intimidate them. And they've been doing this now for a while. And the NAACP held a news conference and complained that not much has changed since the days of slavery. And I think what's changed is that all of that hatred is still there. It's just under the surface. And we're not seeing all of it being manifested the way a lot of people feel. 
That's still going on here in South Carolina. And I'm sure it's going on in North Carolina, Georgia, and in other areas of the South as well. Now, they urged the the family, the NAACP and, and the black family, they've urged the state legislature to enact a hate crimes law. And that's something the LGBTQ plus community here also supports. South Carolina is one of the very few states that don't have a hate hate crime law. I think there's only maybe three others. And that's just incredible to me. But we did. We had a cross burning. I can't believe we actually had a cross burning here. And I've been trying to get the head of the NAACP to come on my podcast, but so far, no luck. Um, we had Biden giving a campaign speech at Mother Emanuel AME Church in Charleston. That's where in 2015, nine black parishioners were murdered uh, by a white stranger who they had invited to Bible to their Bible study. I did not know that. I read that just the other day, that the guy that murdered all those people, he had been invited to come to their Bible study by those people that he gunned down. Anyway, Biden said of that, the word of God was pierced by bullets of hate, of rage, propelled not just by gunpowder, but by poison, by a poison that has for too long haunted this nation. Now, also in South Carolina, the state Democratic Party and the DNC have launched the statewide get out the vote effort to boost voter turnout ahead of its first in the nation presidential primary on February 3rd. Seems a bit difficult, though, with Biden's only challenges coming from candidates nobody ever heard of. So I don't know how much traction that primary is going to get. But in the meantime, First Lady Jill Biden will headline an Educators for Biden Harris event Friday in South Carolina. A longtime educator, she once said, teaching isn't just what I do, it's who I am. That should attract some attention down here, and I'm hoping that it does. Earlier this month, second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, campaigned in South Carolina, firing up voters at Old Grace AME Church and small businesses in Beaufort County and Charleston. Emhoff is uh, Jewish, and he met with Jewish community leaders, discussed their experience and recent hate crime ordinances in the what's called the low country. Then we had the 22-year-old South Carolina Republican, this cracks me up, 22-year-old political director for the state Republicans, 22. Her name is Grayley Estep. She and her mother, Michelle Stalvey Estep, have been charged with third-degree assault and battery for their um, alleged assault on another person that assault took place at Stalvey's Watering Hole in Conway, which is owned by Grayley Estep's family. <laughs> so, as you can see, we have really classy Republicans here in South Carolina. <laughs> and then finally, this is just the coup de grace, I think. Today, the state Senate is supposed to vote on a bill that would allow people to carry a gun, open or concealed, without a license. If there are no amendments, that bill will go to Governor Henry McMaster for his signature. And that's exactly what we need in South Carolina, is people running around with a bunch of guns strapped to their hip. Which I think we already have here in Georgia. Yeah, but but we have it here, too. No longer. Yeah. yeah, we have it here, too, but they just need a license. But if this passes, they won't even need a license. See, You can just go get a gun and carry it around and fire it off if you want to. Incredible. So anyway, that's my shtick. What do you guys got? Anything more? So it's yeah, just two calls to action. Uh, we probably I do have more ducks that we probably should pull out, and okay, because it's getting up to the election season. So we'll I'll pull those out and see what we okay. can do. The other idea I don't know if we've talked about before. Um, have you guys heard of MoveOn.org? Yeah, of course. Um, and they partnered with the Ben and Jerry guys a year or two ago and sold a stamp, a rubber stamp that you can stamp money. Now this particular one is to stamp money out of politics, which I would agree is a good thing. But now that we're in election season, we can do another message on a rubber stamp and every dollar bill that comes in and out of your wallet is stamped those. It is legal. Some people think that this is illegal 
but I've actually had uh, attorneys make an opinion that this is legal um, for political purposes to mark money. And um, it's very cheap and can be effective. If it's something we want to organize out of here, or if anybody is interested, I do need to, uh, we're back in an uh, important election season, get back on the, the action plan for that again this year. So those are my two calls. Oh, and one more, the Rural Organizing Pack. They call them themselves Rural Roots. It's ROP.org, Rural Organizing Projects. A little bit late by the time this goes live. They have a call today, 7 p.m. Eastern. But they are doing some great work around the country in rural areas, organizing people in neighborhoods, trying to find out where your area progressive neighbors are, getting um, signs in those progressive neighbors' uh, yards. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard about them on a uh, radio show a couple of months back, and they're a really good group uh, to follow, especially if you're in a rural area, not in this uh, blue bubble that I live here in Atlanta. So, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's actually the that group's actually got a little traction in North Carolina because our state chair is from a rural county and and she uh, is known for uh, being able to to organize rural areas and she's been active in in trying to get more activity going in rural counties and and my county's got a lot of rural areas in it uh, so we applied but but that organization is one that whose name keeps coming up and uh, I think that uh, I think they're doing a really good job, really effective job, yeah. and, and I, I think it, they'll rise as the year goes on. I think there's another organization, yeah. by the way, and, I, and I'll, I'll try to remember what it is the next time we do a show because the name escapes me right now, which is actually focused on electing progressive state legislators, and and what they will do is they will give you money to hire staff if you're a candidate. That, that's another that, that's something that, that hasn't happened before. That's a new organization that's coming up and on the progressive side, on the democratic side. It's interesting stuff going on in the campaign. Yeah, that's very interesting. For sure. All right. Listen, thanks so much for being with us on Dixie Dems and the Lean to Live podcast, you guys. And I hope you enjoyed and what we talked about and found it to be informative and entertaining. And come back again next month. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and that you found it interesting and informative. Please come back on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time. Our interview shows stream on Mondays and sometimes Thursdays, and you can check out upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. And you can subscribe to our interview version there and to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media, Twitter at Lean to the Left One, Instagram at Lean to the Left One, TikTok at Lean to the Left, and LinkedIn at Bob Gatti. Now, I hope you'll support Lean to the Left too, so we can keep things going. Just click on the Donate tab at the top of the Lean to the Left net homepage and contribute by buying me a cup of coffee that'll really help and would be much much appreciated now this is bob gaddy signing off for lean to the left thanks for sharing your time with